I'm Matt Reed, and today we tackle Brevard County political issues with two great guests, conservative radio host Bill Mick of WMMB and Radio in Melbourne, and Brevard County Democratic operative and commentator Amy Tidd. Also coming up, something fun, our list of the top ten most awesomely irritating figures in Florida politics. And we'll take a look at your letters and feedback on the news. First, I ask Bill and Amy to argue their cases from the right and left on school closures, gun control, and taxes to support baseball or beach tourism here in Brevard. Watch. Bill, Amy, the mm. school board has sort of punted until February 12th a decision as to whether to close four schools here in Brevard in uh, Satellite Beach, uh, Merritt Island, Titusville area, Coco. Should the school board be looking at closing schools at this point, Amy? The school board needs to look at how to find additional funding. These schools are important to the community. Brevard values public education, and there's ways to do that, whether it's going out for another vote or restructuring. There's ways to find the money. So, no, it is very important not to close these schools, and I support the school board completely. I think that they are looking out after the, our children. If they have excess capacity, though, in some place, why not look at consolidating? And if it means closing a school, shouldn't that be what they... This, this was not on the ballot. On the ballot, there was money to fund the schools. They never mentioned closing a school, not one. And two days after the election, Dr. Bigley pulls out a list and says, this is what we're going to do. It was not on the ballot. Um, they could have, the, the vote was very close in this case um, to get extra funding. So I believe that there's solutions. If you bring in all the communities together, one of the things that can be done, they could do a special election by mail-in. And citizens can't raise the money for the special election, but the cities that are being affected could pitch in their part to help pay the, for the special election. Hmm. So there's things that no way that gets close to covering the $800,000 cost of a special election. If you're going to have an election on something of this magnitude, it needs to be an actual election. Their next legitimate opportunity is 2014 in the primary or the general. The folks who jumped the gun, wanted to raise money and fund a special election, didn't happen to look to see if it was legal before they did. You can't privately finance an election in the state. So, Amy, you're right. We do support schools, but we also support proper fiscal management, and this board and this administration mm -hmm. have failed miserably there. That's why the vote wasn't as close as you portrayed, and the voters turned it down, because we mm -hmm. need to see proper fiscal management. We need to see proper management techniques in place when it comes to spending and awarding contracts. They need to get some time under their belt before they come after money. Should we be looking at school closures? Absolutely. Anybody who didn't believe that was a possibility when this vote went in is not familiar enough with the issues to be voted because there are significant financial problems that they need to address. They haven't done so successfully. And a reasonable consolidation that keeps community schools, community schools. You're talking Sea Park and Holland, both of them within a mile, mile and a half of each other in Satellite Beach. It's a no-brainer to close one of those and put the kids in the bigger school. It makes sense to do that. I've got a problem when they consider keeping pet projects because they look good or they think it makes education better in Brevard when it's discretionary dollars. Things like quarter busing for choice schools, things like uh, graduating kids from high school with an associate's degree from BCC when those tax dollars should be paying for high school kids or below in their education. Instead, we're keeping kids in high school, graduating them from high school with an associate's degree that mom and dad should be paying for if you're going to have the kids' college education. I paid for my kids' education. Shouldn't have to pay for anybody else's after high school. Well, I know that the, the referendum failed in the last election by three percentage points. That was mm -hmm. still about six to 8,000 votes or so. 8,254 votes. And a lot of the people that I've talked to that voted against it did not know that the schools could close. And many of them, many Democrats did not vote for it because the school board did not put forward a compelling argument. They said oh, I agree with you programs. that they bungled the PR on this, and they, they bungled the PR since then. Yeah. They've they done said, a very poor job of getting information out they said it was and being solid and, in message. You know, they didn't tell people what they were going to spend it on. People want to know, what will my money buy? This problem was caused by the Florida legislature. Their goal, their job in life is to properly fund education. The school board is to actually implement it. But this was caused by our legislators. I've not seen one of them asked. What do they think about it? I've not seen one of them fighting for these schools, for these teachers. Where are our Florida legislators? I won't disagree. It's a, le a legislative issue that needs to be addressed in Tallahassee. They took funding out of schools. They put it back in last year. But that doesn't alleviate oh. the problems. That, you know, they matched it up. Mm -hmm. What they took out, they put back in. But 
It doesn't le alleviate the problems of mismanagement when you have money that's designated for those capital expenses for keeping maintaining a school that you know you're going to have to have in service for some period of time. It's your responsibility as the elected officials, as the administrators hired by the elected officials, to properly administer those funds and to make sure they're there for the needs that exist. We'll tackle guns and baseball with Bill and Amy coming up in just a moment. Now, here's Public Interest Curator Alice Garwood with a look at your letters and feedback to Florida Today. Two readers express sharply different views on President Barack Obama as he begins his second term. Albert R. Olson of Cocoa Beach writes, I listened to President Barack Obama's almost ferocious inaugural address, and frankly, I found myself cringing and saying to myself, can this man really be our president? What came through to me was Obama's abiding hatred of those Americans who have been successful and wealthy and his obsession with the so-called middle class. And Fred Flanders of West Melbourne writes, now that President Barack Obama has been reelected, even with all the opposition and vast amount of money spent by the right-wing politicians, he begins his second term with a continuation of the dogmatic opposition from the Tea Party and the GOP in general. I believe opposition will come from the right no matter what our president proposes. Two readers didn't think much was gained from Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's testimony before Congress on Benghazi last week. Ray Speck of Melbourne writes, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's performance before the House and Senate committees was a complete farce. I give her credit, though, for doing what she does best, dancing and spinning around the questions and issues, rather than being straightforward with her answers. The bottom line is we have no more insight into what really happened regarding Benghazi than we did four months ago. And James H. Bragg of Melbourne writes, Watching Secretary of State Hillary Clinton during her appearance before committees for both houses of Congress last week was both laughable and a colossal waste of time. It was obvious she was more than adequately prepared for the meaningless questions asked by most members of the Congress. Any first-year police detective or military officer charged with determining the cause of a crime or incident would have done a better job of questioning the Secretary of State. I'm Alice Garwood, Public Interest Curator for Florida Today. Remember, we welcome your comments on anything you see on this subject or read in Florida Today by sending an email to letters at floridatoday.com. Gun control. Uh, President Obama with Joe Biden and, and some others uh, introduced a, a series of gun control measures, I suppose, including uh, universal background checks, a ban on some military-style tactical rifles, known as assault weapons, uh, high-capacity magazines, plus some executive orders to empower and train resource officers, health professionals. In your opinion, does it do any good in Brevard? Well, right now, it is ev on everybody's mind. Everybody is worried about their security. There's been a big shift in America. Now, I looked at a recent poll, and out of the things that he suggested, 74%, recent Reuters poll, 74% of Americans favor a banning assault weapons because that went away. But 86% favor the expended background checks. People okay. want to know, you know, does that person have a mental problem? I mean, we have to follow right. all these rules for cars, but yet people can get guns. Now, I call Representative Posey to find out where are you on extended background checks? Because right now, 40% of guns are sold without a background check. He said that he does not favor expanding, well, his staff, he won't talk to me, but his staff said he does not favor expanding background checks. Why? And 86% of the people in this recent poll did. Hmm. Um, that would be a question to ask him. I mean, I think, I mean, I'm ex-military, I like guns, I like people being able to defend themselves in their house. I mean, Lord help us, that's important. But we need to make sure that we keep the guns out of the crazies' hands. Bill, what do you think? Makes a difference here in Brevard? Makes no difference anywhere in the country. Nothing in the president's executive actions that he signed on that Wednesday after we came back uh, does anything to enhance safety in schools. What this Obama-Biden agenda does, what you saw adopted by the New York State Assembly in such knee-jerk and quick fashion reaction was a feel-good measure that doesn't do anything to limit bad guys having guns in their hands. 
the limiting of magazines and, and their capacity as to the number of rounds that a guy can have. Uh, put up on my Facebook page yesterday, I, I, I shared a photo that came in from a listener that's talking about the bad guy getting ready to go rob a, a New York uh, deli and thinking, oh yeah, I've got to make sure I only have seven rounds of ammunition before I go in. You're not going to restrict bad people from doing bad things by taking law-abiding citizens and turning them into criminals. The quick action on the part of the New York Assembly didn't consider law enforcement officers and they are the new elite criminal class in New York if this law goes into effect as it exists today because they didn't exempt cops or military from heavy capacity magazines, 15, 17 round magazines that policemen carry every day. So it's a feel good measure that doesn't really accomplish anything. The uh, day after the uh, proposal, the NRA came out with a statement opposing the whole thing saying, quote, the fact is, despite their statements, the main goal of the gun banners in Congress is not to make schools safer, but to ban your guns and abolish every last sacred right you have under the Second Amendment until they reduce your freedom to ashes. Really? Is that what you want, Amy? The NRA is a spokesperson for the gun lobby, not for gun owners. If you, if, when they polled NRA owner, gun owners, they did not agree with these things. They speak for the industry. The industry is making a lot of money off of guns, and so that's what the NRA is there for. I know lots of people who have guns, and they support a lot of common sense measures. And I'm sure, Bill, that you must support some kind of way to make sure that we don't have our children gunned down in the schools, our people in the streets. Absolutely. Since Let's institutionalize the nut jobs that need to be institutionalized. We turned them yeah. loose as homeless on this country in the 60s and 70s, and mm -hmm. we haven't done anything to get mental health back in control since. Right. Now, also in that New York legislation, what they did is they put such pressure on the mental health professional that any mention by a patient of I'm having some violent thoughts, they're going to end up reporting these people, potentially, if they have firearms, even if it's a guy just expressing some stress. The guy's got to worry now that he's going to have his guns taken. Is he going to be as apt to go see that therapist when he does need help, or is he going to stay away for fear of losing a firearm? There are unintended consequences here. What we've got in this society, Matt, is a vast overreaction by the uneducated people who are fearful of guns to the point that um, we had in Maryland or, or, or New Jersey a story over the, there's been stories in the news every day. Uh, a kid, high schooler, carrying a Nerf gun, and it was obviously a Nerf gun, bright yellow and orange or whatever, around a school, reported by this fearful parent who didn't know anything about any kind of gun, and we had a SWAT team response by law enforcement. We're, our society's buying into the hysteria. Education is the answer. The NRA is the biggest educator of firearm safety in the country. As a policeman, I was trained by the NRA to teach firearm safety and handling two policemen, two civilians, and they advocate it strongly. They're not an advocate for the gun industry. Yeah, they do, because they advocate for people who use and own firearms, and it all comes in one part of, uh, it's all part of one thing. In that, in the proposals, I didn't see anything that would mm. even take away guns from people yeah. who have been uh, identified as mentally ill. It would primarily prevent them from going this to a, a gun stop. show or yeah. buying another firearm on, on eBay or something like that. Amy, you... Mm -hmm in running for the state legislature yeah. once uh, pointed out that you had an A rating from the NRA. Mm -hmm. What's on a, what is on the NRA's questionnaire? Well, they want to know, will you take guns away from people? Will people, do you support people's right to defend themselves in their homes? I am completely for that. I am completely for, you know, making sure that people can go out and hunt if they want, teach their sons and daughters to hunt. That's important. That's part of our American heritage. I mean, when we were, out in, in the prairie, you saw someone coming, you told your wife to throw on a, another potato, but you grabbed a gun, right? That's America, but now we have people walking around with assault weapons that are military grade. I mean, you don't need armor piercing bullets to go shoot deer, Lord help us. So there is a, there's a fine line in between there, but the NRA is very strong in their lobby. They're very strong in the uh, politicians they own, you know, and I, why are they so strong? And thank God they are, because they represent mainstream Americans who have grown up with the heritage of this country and embracing the, the Bill of Rights, all ten of them. And, you know, we could go after that newspaper in New York for the assault words they were using when they printed the list of handgun owners. You know, if we're going to talk about assault weapons, let's talk about assault words. Uh, we had assault schools where a ten-year-old was uh, 
dressed down in front of her fifth grade class because she had a paper gun that her grandfather had uh, made and given to her. One of those things we used to carry around as kids and you flip it like this and it would pop, make the noise with the paper in it. She was on her way to throw it away, got dressed down in front of her class for having a gun at school. Talked about it just this morning on the show, five-year-old in the bus line getting ready to leave school, talking with her friends about their Hello Kitty blow guns that actually make bubbles. It's a bubble maker. It's a hair, it's a glorified hair dryer with a trigger and they call it a Hello Kitty bubble gun. She was talking about using that and playing with it when she got home. She got a suspension for 10 days because she had issued a terrorist threat. It, the schools are overreacting because they're uneducated. Our society is overreacting because they're uneducated. Let's teach gun safety in our schools and let's, if we want real safety measures in play, let's take our retired military and our retired police personnel. Let's hire them for a reasonable wage to put them in schools to be able to stop something like this when, uh, when the nut job hits the gun. Arm teachers? I don't believe so. I've been in a classroom. Kids are very quick. They will grab that. But I believe this is something American people want something done on, Bill. Do you know that since Sandy Hook, there's been 1,100 people killed in America by gun violence? And how many this of those were legitimate acts of gun violence if in self-defense or defense is, of another? How many? People are dying How every many? Day. How many? Yeah, and some of them should. How many, mm -hmm. Amy? How many of them are self-defense? How many are you dying? You can spout numbers, places. but 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 tell me what which this ones okay are bad. With you? I'm not okay with Potentially, one absolutely. dying from a gun. Absolutely well, we okay with me. Away from that. Absolutely. If I've got someone yeah. threatening me or my family or a stranger as far mm -hmm. as that goes and I have the capability to defend them, you bet your bottom dollar I'm going to. Absolutely. Well, I agree with that. More of my talk with radio host Bill Mick and Democratic activist Amy Tidd in just a moment. Now, some fun with politics. Just for fun, we asked our Facebook fans to nominate and rank the most awesomely irritating figures in Florida politics from the past year. To qualify, these leaders had to irritate a large segment of the electorate, and they must demonstrate a certain exceptionalism that stands out even here in what I call the awesome state. Counting up from our readers, number five, former Treasure Coast Congressman Alan West, a Republican recently ousted after two awesome years in Washington. A Tea Party fave, West was recommended by Sarah Palin and Ted Nugent for vice president in 2012. At a town hall meeting last year, West seriously estimated that, quote, there's about a 78 to 81 members of the Democratic Party that are members of the Communist Party. Number four, Democratic Senator Bill Nelson, a surprisingly persistent source of anguish to some Florida Republicans. As for Nelson's awesome quotient, he's an astronaut whose best known recent accomplishments include, include banning and hunting pythons and fighting to post live web video of the Deepwater Horizon underwater oil blowout on his Senate page. Number three, Minnesota Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. She's not a Floridian, but she made her mark here after the Tampa presidential debate by revealing that HPV vaccines such as Gardasil cause, quote, mental retardation. Also awesome, looking at the wrong camera throughout the Tea Party's response to President Obama's State of the Union address. Number two, former Republican Governor Charlie Crist. The tandem slimmed people's governor just became a Democrat and could run against Governor Rick Scott. After losing the 2010 Senate race to Marco Rubio and the Tea Party, Chris spent the past two years as a TV pitchman and trial lawyer with the Florida firm Morgan & Morgan. And the number one most awesomely irritating figure in Florida politics, according to our readers, Democratic Congressman Alan Grayson of Orlando. Irritating to all but the most combative liberal, the Harvard-trained whistleblower attorney stormed back into office after a two-year exile. You may recall Grayson mocking Republicans' alternative health care reform plan as, quote, part one, don't get sick, part two, if you do get sick, die quickly. Conservative columnist George Will called Grayson, quote, America's worst politician. His campaign bumper sticker said simply, Grayson, truth. He should have added, awesome. Rounding out our list were number six, Congresswoman and Democratic National Committee Chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Number seven, Pastor Terry Jones, the Koran burner and perennial international incident from Gainesville. Number eight, the Reverend Al Sharpton, who turned the Trayvon Martin case into a national media circus last year. Number nine, birther Sheriff Joe Arpaio and his cold case posse, who tried to disqualify Barack Obama from the Florida presidential ballot on grounds that Obama's birth certificate is a forgery. And number 10, Governor Rick Scott who remains persistently irritating to 64% of Floridians, including a majority of Republicans. Now back to Bill and Amy. I want to hear from you. Who, do you. who gets your vote as the most awesomely irritating Florida figure in politics? Amy? 
<laughs> well, definitely Governor Rick Scott. Knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah. I mean, me and the rest of the world. I mean, he's, bol he's polling right now b below bubonic plague, I believe. <laughs> he is uniquely, uniquely Florida in, in the sense that he just has his agenda and he's going for it. I think what made, gives him a certain awesome factor. But he's not from Florida. <laughs> maybe. Well, the fact, you know, it's not so much the, the, the former CEO of the indicted company kind of thing becoming governor of Florida. It's the right. fact that now to overcome that image, he's going out and doing the work days, flipping burgers and, mm -hmm. and uh, working the docks and doing things like that, which is very, has a nice history here in Florida. And, and uh, Definitely awesome. What about you? Am I limited to one? Well, uh, yes. Have to be Alan Grayson with the outlandish things that he says. The fact that he's not really ever called to task on him other than by those of us in conservative media, if you will. And he's a flippin' nut job, and he comes off that way. And the things he says are so outlandish. Uh, if we want to take it local, we could have some fun. But. What was it? The, uh, the, the, he accused the Republican uh, plan during health care reform was yeah. hurry up and die? Don't, don't get sick. Don't mm -hmm. get sick. If you get sick, die quickly. Mm -hmm. There we go. That was his, that was, and still is, the Republican health care plan. All right, well, let's move on to a, a uniquely uh, Brevard story. There is a tourism tax, or a portion of it, that is going to finish paying off bonds for Space Coast Stadium. Now you have different parties in the community saying, let's use that money for something else. You got people that like baseball wanting to spend it on baseball. You got people that are connected to the port and tourism that want to use it to promote tourism a little bit more. What's your take on this? Bill? I love baseball, having been a collegiate and professional umpire for part of my life, and I thoroughly enjoy the life, and it's a wonderful form of entertainment. I think it's a pipe dream for County Commission Chair Andy Anderson to think, A, he will keep the Nationals here, or B, that he could lure a team from Arizona to Brevard, when the reason the Nationals are leaving here, it's the biggest trip for most teams that come to play them. It's a very expensive part of spring training for the Nationals to travel to go play anybody else other than any teams that might be training in uh, at Disney, which right now is the Atlanta Braves. Uh, you're looking at a significant trip. You're looking at major stars in Major League Baseball having in their contracts, they don't have to travel more than an hour and a half to go to a spring training game. So a lot of the stars in a, in a remote area like Brevard is to the rest of spring training in the Grapefruit League, not coming to Brevard to, to be seen by the fans who come here. I would love to think that they could bring in another team from Arizona. Bring my Cincinnati Reds. I would love to see them spring training in town along with the Nationals. And there's a couple of pairings throughout the year that would be fantastic and would be great to see not a realistic thing it's not going to happen major league baseball takes itself way too seriously they want way too much money in these minor league stadiums that and space coast stadium is a great facility but it does require repair and upkeep we'll have the manatees all season long and they do a great job with that franchise there but when you think you're going to be able to keep those i don't just don't see it happening with my baseball background and experience i would like to think i'm wrong but i don't believe so when it comes to these other entities wanting these tax dollars, it's another bureaucratic group of people looking for a way to get their hands on tax dollars. No, they're not property taxes. They're taxes paid by visitors and tourists that come to the area on the hotel and the bed tax, if, if you want to call it that. Why not reduce that and make it more enticing for these people to come here rather than hand money over to people that don't need it already in order for them to spend money to go to conventions and trips and promote Brevard when Florida pretty much promotes itself anyway. Let's do something to enhance our beach communities if we're going to do anything at all. Let's, let's make it more attractive. Let's make it more visitor friendly. Let's stop hounding people when they come into town with parking tickets and speeding tickets and those kind of things. Right. Amy, um, from a democratic perspective, mm -hmm. um, let the tax expire or use it for something else? What do, you, what do you think? Well, the tax runs out, um, and I fully support Andy Anderson's push to keep them here. They have a contract till 2017, and it is these are jobs we're talking about. We do not want an empty stadium sitting there. This money, though, it, it is a little bit of jump ahead to, go, to say that other groups want it. It can only be used for two legal purposes, to pay down the bond and to, to do promote tourism here in Brevard County. Those are the two things that can be used for this one penny out of the five cents okay. tax. So it is sort of a, we're just, but we want to try to encourage them to stay here because it is very important. Now, I do support after the bond is paid off, taking some of this more money to market our tourism. Speaking with the Economic Development Council, um, baseball brings in 25 million about to the community, but other um, ecotourism and the port bring in $3.1 billion to the community. And those, those areas where you can really make a difference, can we can move ahead with those. So I think promoting Brevard, bringing more people here for our wonderful beaches, our wonderful um, the space station, all the things that we have to promote 
The beaches are great. If we're going to involve the EDC, let's get mm -hmm. them doing the job that they need to be doing. They need mm -hmm. to be going to New York. They need to be going to Illinois and other gun manufacturer locations and saying, bring those jobs to Florida, baby. We are gun friendly. We'd love to have those jobs here. <laughs> you want jobs and employment. Right. You're talking full-time jobs that mm -hmm. are technical manufacturing jobs. We've got the workforce here that would be able to handle it. Let's mm -hmm. bring those companies that are being mistreated in New York and right. Illinois and elsewhere. Locate them right here. Let's put those jobs in play. Well, I know we have Knight Armaments up in uh, Titusville that does mm -hmm. produce some of that as well as I think uh, a small manufacturer down in Indian River. So you're saying use tourism money to go get gun manufacturers, not necessarily baseball or the port. I'm what saying drop that, the tax. Amy? Well, I, the, the, I was speaking of the Tourist Development Council, which is different than the Economic Development Council. You're the one who Council. said EDC. Okay, I just so jumped I, on your bandwagon. So I messed up. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, the thing is we need to promote Brevard. We have gems here, and it needs to be promoted. Whether it's our engineers, we have more engineers per square mile than any other place in the world. We need you know, to when I'm vacationing, jobs. the first thing I look for is where are the engineers? That's exactly have, what I want to do. We on have the beaches. We have our wonderful zoo. We just had company here and we had people come in and go, went to the zoo. I and mean, we have wonderful things here. So I'm all That's for very promoting. True. Love this place. Absolutely. In. But yeah. it's a waste of money and this, these groups don't need it to spend it. Let's eliminate the tax and make it more attractive to come here and less expensive. Let's be smart. Amy and Bill, thanks for talking Brevard issues with us today. Okay. Thanks, Thank you man. very much for having us. Well, I hope we helped you better understand the most talked about local issues. You can catch Bill Mick weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m. on WMMB, 1240 a.m. or 1350 in Northern Brevard. The best place to reach Amy today is her Twitter feed, at Amy Tidd. And to comment on anything you see here or in Florida Today, send an email to letters at floridatoday.com. I'm Matt Reed. See you next week on WBCC.